Awesome. <clears throat> Um, so I guess we will go ahead and get started. Um, just wanted to give like a brief overview about Quail Springs, just in case anybody isn't familiar. Um, so Quail Springs was founded in 2004 and is a leading educational nonprofit that sits on a 450-acre permaculture demonstration site on the traditional homelands of the Chumash people here in the beautiful Cuyama Valley, California. Our mission is to empower students of all ages and backgrounds with knowledge, skills, and inspiration essential to cultivating ecological and social health. Um, and then we want to go ahead and give a warm welcome and <clears throat> let our lead building instructor, our natural building director, Sasha Rabin, uh, introduce herself. And get Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I was, I would love to just start with people just typing into the chat where in the world you are joining us from. It just is so nice and helpful to me um, just to just to sort of get a little bit of a feel for where we are all arriving from in this weird world of online. Um, yeah, this weird world of online Zoom. Wow, Singapore, okay. Um, oh, Tascadero, our neighbors. Dominican Republic, wow. We've got Maine, San Diego, Modesto, Goleta. Okay, cool. Thanks, you guys. Well, I imagine too, for some of you, you're probably, um, Wow, Switzerland. Okay, some of you probably are joining us at some really um, inconvenient times of the day. So I also <laughs> appreciate, <laughs> appreciate that. Um, so my name is Sasha Rabin and I am the Natural Building Director at Quail Springs. I lived at Quail Springs for uh, about a decade. And I recently moved up to Northern California to be closer to, to my extended family. And um, yeah, a, a little over a year ago and have since had a kid up here. So I'm a new mom and just adjusting to that world. And it's interesting because one of the things that we have just found that we liked about these online courses was the fact that people could do them with littles running around the house. And um, so now here we are. I, my husband has him right now, so he won't be joining us. Um, but if you join us for the longer course, the actual course, you will probably see him popping into some of the live sessions. I started uh, my natural building education journey about 20 years ago, I apprenticed at a place called the Cobb Cottage Company in Cottage, in, well, started in Cottage Grove, Oregon, and then I did my apprenticeship in Coquille, Oregon, where they moved to, and have since worked with and apprenticed with a variety of other natural builders. Some of my other, just to honor, yeah, just some of my teachers are Bill and Athena Steen, who are some really incredible builders out of Arizona. And at Cobb Cottage Company, it's run by um, a couple, Yanto Evans and Linda Smiley. And they're all am am amongst too many to mention other, other teachers, but just to, to, to speak there. Um, yeah, to speak to, to some of them. I am, it looks like people are still trickling in. We, so I'm going to do about a half an hour presentation and I'm going to try to stall here for another few minutes before I start it because people are still trickling in here. Um, just a little overview of natural building and um, yeah, just, just an overview. What, what is it even? What is earthen building? And then show you some photos of some of the potential projects that you might make in the, if you choose to take the course with us and some of the projects from some past students. I would all, I have one more question for you all to type answers into chat. Um, I would love to know, and it can just be like a yes or no, or you can add more. Um, 
let's see, I'm, I'm rethinking how I'm going to ask you to answer this. Um, I want to get a little feel of people's experience with natural building and you can answer yes or no. If you feel super confident when, and when I, to even know what is natural building, what is Cobb, what is earthen building? Like, what do I mean when I say those things? If folks could just write yes or no, or sort of, um, that would give me a, just a, a good little insight into, into our audience here too, if y'all are willing. Um, oh, British Columbia, okay. Great, okay. And just while people are typing things in there, if you have questions throughout the, the talk, you can type them into chat and Donnie or Erin will read them out afterwards. Or if there is something that is like super pertinent to what I am saying, and it's like something that doesn't feel like it'll disrupt the flow, I don't mind questions during the presentation either. Or at the end, there'll be a chance, probably most ideal at the end for you to unmute yourself and just ask your question yourself. I am not capable of tracking the chat while presenting. Um, so Donnie and Aaron will be tracking the chat and I will get to the questions at the end. And if there's something super pertinent in the moment, that's fine too. Hi, Sasha. How about um, if there is someone who has a pertinent question to the section that you're talking about, then um, one of us can unmute and ask you the question. Perfect. And so Perfect. everyone can type their questions in the chat. Perfect. Um, yeah, and if you want to hold your questions till the end and ask them yourself, that is great too. Um, great. So kind of the whole the whole range of people with some experience and and none. So that's great. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is everyone able to see that? Okay. Great. This actually is the office at Quail Springs. If we reversed the, the camera from where Aaron and Donnie are sitting, this is what you would see. <laughs> so just a little bit about earthen building, there are as many different types and methods of earthen building as there are places and people building. Okay, not quite, but you get the idea. Huge range of different techniques and traditions from all over the world. And these systems have all been born out of needs and culture and family systems and history. This photo on the bottom is from England and that is where our specific lineage of earthen building that I am mostly do comes from, but just a little, you know, want to share a little bit more. So the one in the middle is in India, the one on the, I guess I don't know if it's your guys' left or right. My left is from Mali, and then there's one from China. So very, these all have similarities in the ways that they're built and constructed and all have a lot of differences too. So if we were live, I'd be asking you all this question, but I think you probably know that the answer is kind of obvious. So earth, even today, we think of it as being kind of a niche, kind of an unusual thing. And even today, it is the most common building material on the planet. There are still more people building and living with earth and building materials and systems than any other single material. So I think that that's helpful just in terms of some context and realizing, and that reminder that like, right, this isn't, it is unusual in a lot of like places I've lived, 
not all, you know, in parts of the US, uh, like the Southwest, it's still super common, but most of the US, not so common, but just, yeah, just that reminder. And while we're on this slide, I'm, these buildings are also from West Africa. And I'm just gonna point out some cool features, a little side note here. Cool features of these particular buildings is that they have this beautiful three-dimensional patterning on them. And it does two things. One of which is that it slows down water running off. And for any of you who are familiar with different permaculture principles, so there's a principle of slowing the flow of water down so that water sinks in. So you caught more erosion is caused the faster that water runs. So this pattern, not that we're get, trying to get the water to soak in, but we're trying to get it to not erode, right? So this patterning slows the, the water trickling down the buildings and keeps, um, keeps it from eroding as fast. And, and I don't have this photo in this slide for you guys or in this presentation for you all, but this also, this patterning also works as scaffolding. So there's also, you can climb up and access the tops of the buildings to replaster. So the main system of earthen building that I do that we've done at Quail Springs is called cob and or monolithic adobe. And part of that reason is that that's what I studied and that's what I kind of came to Quail Springs with my knowledge base in, but it also was the most appropriate building material for that location and climate. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But. The basic materials that we're talking about for a number of different systems, not just cob, is a clay soil. And a clay soil means a native soil to, you know, that just that you dig up on the side of the road or wherever or in your backyard that has a high enough clay content to it, which is not actually that much. Some people say, like, oh, I have this great clay. It's like, my yard is solid clay. And it's like, oh, that's actually not that ideal. That just means you have to add a lot of sand. So our other material is sand. And most locations have one or the other of those materials readily available on site. Quail Springs happens to have both, which is pretty awesome. So there's a spot that we gather clay from and a spot that we gather sand from. And to make our cob or our adobe or a variety of different earthen building materials, and we combine the sand and clay in different amounts and quantities, as well as mixing it with some sort of fiber. Most cases, it's straw. And the straw we do bring in from offsite. You can, if you have a lot of grass, you can also use that. But straw is pretty plentiful and pretty affordable. So and light, so it's an easy one to transport. So this is often, here in the US, this is often what our cob mixing might look like. And we mix it on tarps, and it's super fun that it's really accessible to do with, with the little ones. And it's fun. So what is cob? We'll talk about that for a second here too. Oh, wait, I'm going to talk about that in one second. And this is often what it looks like when we are applying our wet earthen material. Um, we do it with our hands. This is one of the buildings at Quail Springs. And this building is one that I built and lived in for most of the time I was there. And it is a combination of a lot of different earthen building techniques. I will throw out some different terms and it's okay if they don't all make sense, but there's cob and there's adobe and there's it's called earth bag, which is a rammed earth technique. And there is waddle and daub. And the only thing I'm going to get into saying in detail about this building is that the part that is domed and arched overhead is not cob. It is a very, very much lighter material. I wouldn't use cob in a dome shape. I wouldn't use cob overhead. It's too heavy and not seismically stable enough to have it overhead. So just to clarify that. 
So probably the most common building, earthen building techniques that we do are cob and adobe. And I'm just going to touch on the differences there. So cob, you saw uh, the way that we're, we're mixing it, this wet material on a tarp with our feet. And we use that material while it is still wet and pliable and build up our wall. And you're able to build, depending on your climate and depending on how wet your mix is, anywhere in the range of eight inches to 12 inches in one day, in one like lift. Adobe is often very similar materials, but you dry bricks out in the sun. Neither of the systems are fired. They're just dry naturally in the sun. So there's no actual curing and chemical change. It's just a matter of them drying in different ways. The benefit of cob over adobe is that because the way you build it, it dries in one monolithic piece. So it is more seismically stable than adobe. I could talk for the whole hour about like the pros and cons of each one in certain situations you know, one is better in certain situations, another is better. Like all of these systems and methods, there are situations where one might be more advantageous than the other. So there's nothing that is better or worse. So one of the things that I've spent a lot of my just journey in natural building, thinking about housing and homes and all of it, is just looking at the bigger cultural context of what we, how, how we view houses. And, I, and I'm just speaking from a very um, United States centric sort of position here, but we have, we have so many codes and permitting process that building your own homes or shelter have bec has become completely inaccessible. So this is a photo from Montecito, which is now the like uber wealthy suburb of Santa Barbara. And this is a couple, this photo I believe is from the forties. And I read an article about them and they had moved up here from Mexico. They bought a piece of land for $2,000 and they built their house. And you can see adobes piled up back here and their house is still standing today. And I just feel like that idea that you could with very little means, but you know, a lot of just muscle, the idea that you could just go and buy a piece of land and build a house for your family is so far from where we are today. And I just want to presence the fact that it hasn't always been that way. Like it's not, and it, it doesn't have to be that way. So the, this is a photo from England and these are all cob buildings. This is where the tradition of earthen building that I really do mostly comes from. These are probably, I don't know specifically in this photo, but they're likely four or five, 600 year old buildings that are still standing with thatched roofs. So all earthen materials, some sort of stone at the base to get the earthen materials up off the ground. And yes, in a very, you know, wet, damp climate. And here is another one of the buildings at Quail Springs. So just sort of, this is sort of, that's the tradition that these come from. And then a lot of the buildings that we do are a little more whimsical and a little more, you know, creative or fun. One of the fun things about the systems is that you can integrate in anything. You can integrate in, you know, a round window. You can't really see it in this photo, but just for example, right here above the cactus is this round window that was a hand blown glass plate that was a wedding gift for Chan and Brenton that they never used. And we're like, let's stick it in the wall and make a window. So all sorts of things that you can do with you know, different, different fun things. So another piece of what we have been working on at Quail Springs is the, is a bunch of testing. So kind of from that perspective of why is it that we're not able to just build our own shelter for our friends and, you know, for our, ourselves and our families anymore? And what are the hurdles? And 
a lot of people say that the main hurdles are access to land. And I don't actually believe that. My feeling on it is that the main hurdles for people being able to just build their own shelter is our is our government regulations and our current litigation culture. And I think that if we were truly allowed to build a shelter on a piece of land without spending tens of thousands of dollars on permitting fees and having to comply to certain regulations, if we could just build something, take responsibility ourselves, if anything happened, I think actually that land would become accessible. The challenge right now is that even if you had an empty lot in the middle of LA, you can't just say, oh yeah, let's build 10 tiny homes on it so people can live here. Um, so basically when we look at the bigger context of safety, you know, this, this idea that these codes and permits create are there to create safety and Yes, there are certain things, especially like house collapse and structural fires that have been very well addressed with our codes and regulations. There are other things like wildfires building in inappropriate places that are now the leading cause here in California of, of how, houses being lost. And that's not addressed very well at all in our codes. So that's a little sort of background of where I'm coming from. And I think that the other, the other challenge or the other thing that we're up against is that most people, it was that very few pieces of what creates safety are considered in the codes. And one of the major pieces that we don't consider at all is what happens when people don't have a home at all? and they're homeless and the dangers with that. And I think that that should be a part of the conversation around shelter and around safety. And it's not just about you know the electrical wiring. It's also about the alternatives when we don't have um, the means to, to build something to those codes. So that's a little bit of, I'll get back. I'll get back to the slide. <laughs> um, so kind of from that perspective, a number of years ago, we sort of shift some of our focus to testing. So that's one of the one of the things that hinders the codes and regulations is not having modern day testing. So about, I think it's 2018, we did seismic testing. That's a photo of this here. We've done some thermal testing and some compression testing and some fire testing. So I'm gonna first talk about the fire testing. So it's kind of ridiculous because we can all agree that earth does not burn. We use it to build ovens and fireplaces for centuries. And yet still for a lot, for certain situations, not, not most residential houses, but for certain situations, you still need what's called an ASTM E119 fire rating to prove that Cobb, that earth does not burn. So we raised about $60,000 and my partner, John and I went to Texas to build these two walls in this facility in Texas. And one of the other downsides with our current way that these are done here in the US and it extrapolates into what's called the International Building Code, which is used all over the world, not everywhere, but quite common is that most of the testing is bought and is paid for by the companies that choose, that are hoping to make a profit on that building material. Well, there's no, I mean, inherently these materials, no one is making a profit on. So basically we have to raise all the money ourselves to do this massive project. So here are photos of the walls that we built. It's a two hour fire test where on the other side of this wall, it's being blasted with heat for two hours and um, for over 2000 degree temperature on the back side of this wall. And then you have all these probes on the front of this wall and it 
the front of the wall barely raised above uh, above the air temperature. It raised like one degree in the two hours. And then the other part that we were a little more skeptical about, we were pretty confident that this would be fine, is that they then blast the wall with a fire hose for two minutes. And it's totally absurd because if you had a cup house and there was a fire, maybe you have a rose bush out front that's on fire. They are not blasting your cob wall for two minutes with a fire hose. Like there's just no, that's just not going to happen because the wall will not be on fire. Um, but our wall passed. And then the other ironic part of this is that one of the reasons it did so well is because the, the clay actually, actually kind of vitrified, it fired basically. So it withstood the fire hose pretty well. So it's just, it's no, it makes no sense. Like we, so we go through all these hoops and stuff to go, great. We now have an ASTM E119 fire rating for two hour wall. Um, and it did pass and it got into the code. There is a, there is a residential Cobb code. And then um, from this research that we did with Pale Springs, this did get integrated into the code last year as well. So it's exciting and it's great. And it's also kind of ridiculous. So this is, um, so in Japan, there's a tradition, a lot of the, the houses there are wood, but there is a tradition of building something called a kura, and it is an earth, a earthen building where people would store their valuables and their food stores and all this. So you can see these huge, massive, thick doors that shut. And this is a photo of a fire in Osaka. And I'm blanking on the exact year, but these are the um, earthen buildings that are built to store their valuables that you can see survived the fire. Here's the seismic testing we did. And this was with these two graduate students from Cal Poly and a engineering professor named Dan Jansen. We built four different walls and did a an out of plane test, which basically is if this is your wall, it's if you're, it's mimicking the seismic activity pushing sort of this way on the wall. And then on, I think two of the tests, we did an in plane, which is this direction pressure. And the walls fared really well. I have to admit, I'm not, I can't totally even follow the long thesis that was written about them because that's not really the engineering side of it. It's not really my realm, but the walls did great. So another test that we've done. So then you get all that information and then the engineers also need to know the compressive strength. So how much weight can we put on these materials? And so here's our blocks that we would make and then this they would get tested basically with a certain amount of weight on top of them and then oh I didn't I don't have a photo but then the other one that we did was thermal testing which is basically like rating the insulative value of the material so that's a little on the testing I'm just going to pause um, are there any like pertinent questions to I feel like that might be a good Point to let a few pertinent questions to that be asked. And then I can jump into just showing a little bit more about what we're going to be working on in the, in the course. Um, we can wait too, if that's better, Donnie. Um, yeah, if folks have any questions pertaining to what Sasha just presented, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions, or you can wait till the end. Just gonna give you all a moment here in case, yeah, just in case there is any question that makes sense to ask now, you can unmute yourself and. In terms of regulations, um, are there certain states, like I'm in Texas, I know it's a bit looser, right? Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm using Google Slides that I haven't used before and I keep, I don't have as much um, control of the slides. Um, there we go. Yes, yeah, so that is one of the unfortunate and complicated things about understanding the codes and permits is that they're not only different state to state, but also county. And we probably have the most 
restrictive building codes because of our seismic activity. And uh, yeah, I would guess. And then usually most urban places have a little more restrictive building codes compared to more rural places. So yeah, unfortunately, I can't really speak to what they are anywhere other than than here. But definitely, I would guarantee that you're going to have a lot easier of a time than than we do. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Kenzie in the chat. Does the residential cop code apply to the nation or California specifically? Yeah, so it's part of what's called the International Building Code, and it's up to local jurisdictions to adopt it. So some states and counties will adopt anything that is in the residential code, and some only adopt specific pieces. And so right now it's actually technically an appendix, which has one more layer of difficulty or of like step that a local jurisdiction does to have to um, adopt it. There's a great article in Mother Earth News written by someone named Michael Smith. And I and it, he kind of breaks down and goes into a little more detail about the Cobb Code and all this stuff. I will send Dani the link to that. And maybe we can send it out in the follow-up from this. Does that, does that work? Um, and that's a good way to get a little more detailed yeah, information. And then there's two more questions in the chat. Okay. Um, Eric asks, is the general mixture of cob between different regions similar enough that the co code stands for any cob? So the code has really specifics about mixing your own cob. So it is different in different places, but it, it does break down how to find your own mix and it gets into like a certain amount of shrinking and stuff like that. So the code um, isn't, it doesn't specify one mix per se. And then the other thing that we've gotten into doing with some of the testing is getting really specific with and referencing the materials by weight. So uh, basically looking at like a cubic foot of cob and looking at what that, what it weighs. So with the compression test, I'm gonna go back to it. Nope, how do I go back? Hmm, oh, here we go. Um, so you can see here in this photo, 75 pounds per cubic foot, 51 pounds per cubic foot, 113 pounds per cubic foot. So that's all really spe specifically, we weigh and measure all the ingredients so that we can create a cob mixture that is the certain weight that we're going for. And that's sort of the, for a lot of the testing, that is the, the sort of number that we're working with. So maybe that answers your question. I'm not exactly sure, but yeah, everywhere has to come up with their own, um, their own mixture for your site. And then there's a range. I mean, it's all like within the range general. I mean, I've done a few projects where you have like four sand to one clay, but mostly it's like two to one, either direction, two sand, one clay, one, one, or two clay, one sand, something in that range. And we have two more questions in the chat. Um, there's from Romy. In terms of regulations, do you have experience with South Africa and Europe in the last few years? I don't. And the second question is, is there from, uh, from Kaylee, Coley, uh, is there a size restriction to building with Cobb and the International Building Code? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not, I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't think so. I don't think that they get into size specific. There is different engineering things that you would have to do if you wanted to go like tall, like tall or stuff like that. So you might have to do additional engineering to go bigger, but I don't think the code specifies a size limit, but I could be wrong. 
I think these are all the questions for now. Great. I'm going to um, show a handful more slides and then we can open it up for more questions. So with the, with the online workshop that we're doing, there are three main hands-on projects, cob oven, a small little rocket, rocket stove cooker, and a earth bag retaining wall. So cob oven is probably the one of those that most people are more familiar with. And I think it is like the best starter project for cob building. And whenever someone approaches me and says, I want to build a cob house, it's like, let's start with an oven. Um, it's also somewhat attainable. It's, a, you know, you can do it in a long, in a weekend or whatever. So, um, and you can get really fun and artistic and creative. So here's an oven that I built up in Oregon. Here's one here in Northern California. You do generally want to put a roof over it, depending on your climate, but if you want it to remain, you know, looking nice and you can cook all sorts of fun things in it. So this is a photo of just roasting garlic, but you can cook basically anything that you cook in a regular oven, you can cook in a cob oven. Um, pizzas are probably the most popular and that's super fun, but you can also like bake cakes and cookies and roast meat and whatever. And then the little rocket stove cooker that we do a video of how to build. This is just one of the other things that we built that you could use that for. This is basically just the little rocket stove is heating water in a bathtub. And this is the rocket stove cooktop that we built um, and videoed for the course. So it's just a, it's a really highly efficient way of using wood as fuel to cook with. It's a very clean burning. It has an internal, it has a heat riser inside and it burns the smoke basically. So you get a very clean combustion. And a fun little earth bag wall. So this is also at one of the buildings. This is at one of the houses at Quill Springs and this is the, the retaining wall that we did that we videoed for this course as well. And then on the photo on the left are two people applying earth and plaster over the earth bag. And then I'm just gonna share a few photos of some of the projects that people did. This was last year's project. This man's name is Mizba and he lives in Indonesia. And he did both of the projects. He did this cob oven as well as this little rocket cooker on the side of it. And he like hosted a little workshop work party to build it. And yeah, it sounded super fun. I wish it was closer. And this is up in the foothills, pretty close to here. A uh, woman and a couple of her friends built this cob oven in, in, I can't remember if it was one weekend or two, but not, you know, not that much time. And most, and they had never, these folks had never built with Cobb before. So this is a fun little project um, that a man named Benito did down in Riverside. And it was kind of this just kind of unused part of his yard that he wanted to create a little hangout zone in. So he did the earth bag wall and then covered it in Cobb and had a work party and did a whole bunch of fun, just decorative sculpting on the outside. And that's, it's just a little enclosed little bench zone in this part of his property where there was really just like no, no nice way to use it. So, and he has bottles in here and those four patches that you see are his plaster samples. So what you're seeing is like a really rough plaster over the earth bag. And then that's a, a more refined plaster mix. And the way to do it is to do samples first to see if it cracks or falls off or whatever. This is a project that a student did the first year we did the course two years ago named Isla down in, um, in LA, in a very urban part of LA. And she got really into the sculpting of it. And I guess this photo is slightly better there, but she built this whole dragon on it. And, and she did this project too, just to throw out another idea. 
she didn't have a place to build it herself. So it was in a friend's backyard that wanted one. She just asked them, can I build this there? And they're like, sure. So you also don't have to have your own land. And I think that is, that's what I got for you. I'm going to unshare and open it back up for questions again. Yeah, and it can be questions about anything about just the general building techniques or about the course itself or whatever. And you can either type them into the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak a little bit to the course before um, the Great. questions. Um, the course is starting on June 15th, so that's a week away. And it's a self-paced six month course online. So um, um, this is our third year posting the online course and it has been really made really accessible for folks who can't come to in-person courses or live very far away from Coral Springs. And it's been amazing to just see, yeah, all the ovens and stoves that people have been able to build and, you know, with their community. Um, <clears throat> so also just to, yeah, uh, let you know that uh, we will send out a discount code for folks who would like to register as a thank you for attending this webinar. Um, so to expect that in your email. And yeah, for folks who have questions about the course itself or other natural building questions, um, please unmute yourselves and ask. I can also answer the couple that I just saw in the chat. Um, I, I'm just gonna say a little bit more about the course to add on to what Donnie was saying. So the course is a combination of the pre-recorded video and three live sessions that look kind of like this, where people can ask questions and I'll present about various things pertinent to what people have been asking about. And also a live Slack channel that we check daily or every other day where people can just type in their questions. Like I'm midway through my project and this is happening or whatever. And that's a very, some people have gotten really into that. And so we, yeah, we're kind of available whenever to respond to written questions mid project, which has ended up being a really interesting way to go because people are actually have access to ask the questions when they're in the middle of the project rather than coming and taking a workshop, kind of thinking you know what to do and then going home and then going, oh my God, I have no idea. Um, so someone asked, is using grass as structurally strong as straw? Probably not. So the straw in your mixture gives what's called tensile strength, which is the material's ability to like pull apart. And different straw has different tensile strength, but you can just take a couple pieces and try to just pull them. And so different grain, different grasses from different grain is going to have different strength. But if it's, if you have three pieces in your hand and it's quite difficult to break them by pulling, then I'd say probably good enough. When we're doing our like testing and stuff, we're using like legit straw. So I've never gotten super into using different grasses and stuff because straw is so abundant and it is kind of a waste product and it's pretty cheap. And so, um, and yes, I, the other question is, does the course include all three parts? Um, yes, all of the parts so that, so you could do all three of them if you wanted. As regards, um, I don't, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. As regards how you were saying like a, a somewhat of a roof over the oven. <clears throat> I live in Arizona. I know like Adobe does pretty well here. Would it do well on its own out here or would it still be advised to put some type of, of protection over it? No, you're fine. It's really would be a matter of like aesthetic, I would say mm -hmm. in that climate. So cob and these earthen materials actually erode away like pretty darn slowly. Mm -hmm. The major ways that buildings collapse due to moisture is if there's a, if you have a roof and there's like a, a damage in the roof. And so it's actually funneling like a large amount of water to one area, then you'll sometimes get some collapse, but earthen materials just left out yeah. erode very slowly, especially in places that when it rains, then it dries and it yeah. rains and dries. It's not like it's just 
wet for the winter and then you're going to get mold and stuff like that. So at Quail Springs, also high desert, we do not have roofs over our ovens. I also don't mind the aesthetic of the plaster slowly wearing away over a few years and then you give it a fresh coat and then it slowly wears away. So if you wanted it to look like some really elaborate perfect design on the outside, then you'd have to put a roof over it. But just for the functionality of the oven, definitely not in Arizona. That was my next question, but you answered it is, so if it does erode, you can just go back on. You don't have to really, with Cobb, you don't have to go back to. No, just absolutely. The same way that the ovens are tended in many parts of, uh, around the world, but like specifically for you, the Southwest of the US mm -hmm. is the ovens are just replastered every handful of years. And and truly all over the world, most of these systems have just um, traditions of maintenance. Every few years, the people, you know, give some love to their buildings. And we have such a different sort of idea of that here in the US. It's like we build these buildings that only last 30 or 40 years. And in that 30 or 40 years, we don't want to have to touch them once. But then they're trash, right? As opposed to no buildings they're alive they require maintenance and you just keep up with it and they'll last centuries and i would also say that cob ovens are actually such an easy project they don't need to be thought of as something that like is going to be here for 50 years it's like build it enjoy it maybe you want to rebuild it somewhere else and that's fine too so any other questions I kind of have a general question about cob houses. Um, are they built on stone because of um, like wet ground, I guess? So you build it on stone? Yeah, so you can build it on a variety of things. The basic rule of thumb with all of these earthen building systems is to get your earthen materials up off the ground to separate them from moisture and from water wicking up from the ground into your, into your earthen building material. So stone is used for foundations um with more permitted projects and unfortunately also oftentimes cement is used also in places where seismic um activity might be more prevalent you might want to use more of a monolithic foundation like cement but we use earth bags sometimes for our foundations um yeah but basically to separate your earthen material from the wet ground Thanks. That was a good, I, I missed that. That's an important piece though. Oh, what are earth bags filled with? Um, they are filled with, so they're a type of what's called rammed earth, which is a, a type of a natural building or type of earthen building. And it's a clay soil. that's a little more on the sandy side and usually it's mixed so that it's a kind of a crumbly like material. Whereas if you make a ball of it, it'll kind of hold its form and you fill the bags with it. And there's systems and ways to fill the bag. It's not as difficult as it looks when you see the like 20 foot long bag. And then you tamp it and the compression really makes it like super hard. And so again, it's a really good system for places that have the right material. And the right material is like a sort of sandy loam basically but you can totally do it wherever. In the photograph of the last, the last photograph you showed with the, uh, I think it was the dragon stove. Mm -hmm. it, it looked like the bricks that were surrounding the opening to the oven were made of the same material as the stove, which I haven't seen before. Could you talk about those different materials and how they're not different in that one or are? Or yeah. Like I just went back to Thanks. the photos. So I was like, are they? Um, they are actually, fire, they are fire brick. They um, just look the same color as the, um, I'm just gonna see if, oh, here we go. They, they look the same color as the clay, but can you see this now? Yeah. Okay. But they are actually fire brick. You can also use just like regular red brick for that. They won't last quite as long with the heat. Um, 
And I will say people use for, I generally use fire brick, but people have been doing this for hundreds of years and you can totally just shape the door opening with cob as well. It'll crack and crumble over time and you'll have to patch it, but you can absolutely do without the fire brick. The fire brick on the base of the oven are really nice because that allows you to cook right on the, on the oven floor and not get like chunks of dirt in your food. But you can also do the floor your oven with cob and you just wouldn't cook directly on it. You'd cook in pans. Thanks. Yeah. We have time for a few more questions. Anyone? Well, is oh sorry. I know I was gonna say as for as regards like the rocket stoves. Um, cause I've seen in some like earthen shelter books or things like that, using it for, um, bench seating. Is that the same type that you would use to, for heated style seating? It's the same basic principle The heating. I would also say if you wanted to build a rocket stove for like heating inside your house, which, mm -hmm. um, I, we built one in our house. I love it. I would say, start, start with the small little rocket cooktop. It would be a great, a great starter project. The rocket, the full on rocket stove is a much more complicated project. There have been, uh, it's a little more than I am capable of guiding someone through via, via Slack. That being said, there are a couple people who've taken this course and done that because they were already started in, you know, with one or something. So if, you know, if you're someone that has some basic understanding of these things and feels like they want to take that on, that's also fine. And we can like help you as best we can. Um, the actual video of how to is of the simpler project. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, how do you get a copy of the code? You can download the code for free at Cobb code.org, which is another organization that I'm on the board of the Cobb called the Cobb Research Institute. And they're the ones that sort of like got the code um, written and passed. And I believe that, thanks, someone just wrote that in, um, that we have free downloads um, that we get a cheaper deal on and um, get and have people just download them for free from there. Patrick, do you have a question? You're muted. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm a little late getting in here. So I'm just wondering, uh, is the recording going to be available? Yes. yes and the recording will be sent out um, to your email after the event. Oh, excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so there's a question here. Do I know of other projects I've been pressed rings where people are building homes with earth? Yes, lots and lots. Is there a specific part of the world that you're inquiring about? Simone? West Coast. Um, there is, yeah, I mean, there's actually cool projects happening in urban places. There's, um, I mean, a variety of buildings that we've built, like in the Santa Barbara area, there's a community not that far from me called Emerald Earth that has a number of different earthen buildings. Um, where I live outside of Ukiah and we're doing a handful. And then as you go farther up the coast, there's a lot of different sites. I mean, both people building projects, but also like the Cobb Cottage Company has a site in Coquille that has maybe dozens of buildings and Portland, there's a lot. Um, probably on the West Coast, I, I mean, in British Columbia, there's actually a lot, um, like on Salt Spring Island, there's a few different organizations, probably hundreds up and down the West Coast, I would say. Um, and then the East Coast, yes. Climate wise, your buildings are gonna look different there. There's a lot of amazing natural building happening in the Northeast. It, looks really different. Um, the, there's a lot of, you know, different things to contend with, not as much seismic activity, 
but it's really cold. So there's a really great organization called um, Deva Rakusin is the man who runs it um, and Ace McCarlton. And I will think of the name of it, but it's not coming to me right now, but they're in Vermont. And um, there's a lot down in the Southeast too, like in North Carolina and stuff like that. So yeah, lots, lots happening all over. And maybe I will, thank you. And I will maybe um, this other question about is it common to add cob structures and rocket stoves to homes that are not built out of earthen materials? Thank you, Donnie. <laughs> New frameworks. There are lots of ways that these built systems are applicable to buildings that are not originally built out of earth. The main thing that you have to make sure is that your foundation can support the added weight of these materials. They're really, really, really heavy materials. So if you're house is built up on, you know, has a basement, then I, I believe that it's most houses after the 60s have to be um, in the US have to be um, built to be able to hold a waterbed. So most buildings, most of those would be able to, you know, hold the weight of a rocket stove. And there's other ways like, um, there's other systems to like, you can use these materials to just plaster over a sheetrock wall and you can do an earthen plaster on, you know, over your drywall in your, in your living room. And yeah, lots of fun ways that they can be used. And I kind of feel like that is the probably most interesting and pertinent way to use these materials is in existing houses. Like we have, there's a lot of houses that exist that could just use a little, a little love to make them a little more interesting. Um, building code applying Canada. So we're going to send out a link that has an article that talks more about the code and the code is, um, specifically only adopted in certain areas if that area has adopted the code. So I, I can't really speak to different, different areas, but, um, we'll send out some information with that. Um, thanks for the great questions y'all. Donnie or Erin, do you guys have anything else you want to add to wrap things up? Um, yeah, thank you everyone for asking so many questions and engaging um, during this webinar. I'm, I learned a lot of new things also. <laughs> yeah, um, just, yeah, great appreciation to Sasha for bringing this knowledge. And if you, you know, are curious to start building or want to engage with like just like learning how to build with earth understanding the materials around your environment um, please join us for um, our online natural building course that's starting in one week on june 15th and it is a six month course um, you will get four months of slack instructor support which yeah, we really believe that is the core of what, what makes this course so special. You have access to the instructor during your building process and also time to ask questions in, uh, during our three live sessions. Uh, this recording will be sent out to you after the webinar and we'll also send out the discount code um, as well as the article that Sasha mentioned um, for reference. So yeah, just thank you everyone for coming, asking great and engaging questions, and we hope to see you in the course. Yes, thank thanks you. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Good night or morning or afternoon or whatever it is. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.